This is Vern Benham Grimsley with the Spiritual Renaissance broadcast. According to medical science history, at the time of the American Revolution, over 200 years ago, rampant disease held the average life expectancy down to only 34.5 years for men and 36.5 for women. Smallpox, yellow fever, tuberculosis, malaria, cholera, dysentery, typhoid, diphtheria, measles, and mumps all took a tragic toll, and half of those who died were children under the age of 10. Even then, such traumatic practices as purging and bloodletting were routine treatments, and surgery was performed without anesthesia. So, in just 200 years, the average American life expectancy has doubled. Thus, our human quantity of life is on the increase. But what of quality of life? Another study of a cross-section of average Americans today conducted by the Illinois Institute of Technology revealed the fears which most commonly plague people. Heading the list was concern over money matters, which included worry about losing one's job, making ends meet, dealing with unpaid bills. Other fears at the top of the list involved a state of one's health, making the right impressions on social and business contacts. Another study on the quality of life revealed today's young adults show a marked departure from the so-called materialistic outlook, according to a book by Ronald Englehart of the University of Michigan Center for Political Studies. The book, based on a series of surveys gathered during the last 10 years in the United States and in 10 Western European countries, revealed a shift, especially in the generation born after 1945, from a materialistic to what the authors call post-materialist outlook. The post-materialist, according to this study, is more concerned with self-expression and with quality of life than with quantity of life and the mere accumulation of property. But of this growing quest for meanings and for values, Fulton Sheen wrote, as man conquers outer space, he seems to lose the conquest of self. In direct proportion, as he masters what is outside of him, he seems to become enslaved on the inside. He has more room in which to stretch his muscles. He has less room in which to expand his soul. His thoughts dwell on orbiting the moon, but he himself often has no orbit, no one thing around which he revolves. He knows how to control the universe. He does not know how to control himself. Sixteen out of twenty-one civilizations that have decayed from the beginning of the world until now did not succumb or fall through attacks from without. They fell by attacks from within, by decay of the spirit. The most urgent need of this war-ravaged world is for a spiritual renaissance among all the peoples of this planet, and there exists a realistic basis of hope for just that. As an example, how many are aware of the fact that there is some form or another of the golden rule to be found in all 11 of the world's great living historic religions? Christianity, all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do you also to them. In Confucianism it is written, Do not unto others what you would not have that they should do to you. In Buddhism the same point is made in this way. In five fashions should a clansman minister to his friends and familiars by generosity, courtesy, and benevolence, by treating them as he treats himself, and by being as good as his word. In Hinduism it is written, Do not to others what if done to thee would cause thee pain. In Islam it is written, No one of you is a believer until he loves for his brother what he loves for himself. In Sikhism we find the words, As thou deemest thyself, so deem others, then shalt thou become a partner of heaven. In Judaism, what is hurtful to yourself, do not to your fellow men. Jainism, in happiness and suffering, in joy and grief, we should regard all creatures as we regard our own self. In the teachings of Zarathustra Zoroaster, that nature only is good when it shall not do to another whatever is not good for its own self. In Taoism and Shinto, regard your neighbor's gain as your own and regard your neighbor's loss as your own loss. Inclusive meetings of spokespersons for world religions have been few and far between. There was a parliament of world religions held at the Chicago World's Fair at the end of the last century and another more recent conclave on the theme Religion and Peace conducted at the Great International Conference Hall in Kyoto, Japan. In attendance were Buddhist monks, Christian priests, Jewish rabbis, Hindu swamis, Shinto priests, and an extensive intermingling of racial heritages. And most of the influential historic faiths took part. The conference was held in affirmation of the essential oneness of the human family, a oneness transcending creeds and dogmas. And at the conclusion of this Kyoto Symposium, the following four principles 
were unanimously affirmed by all the religious leaders in attendance. Number one, the sacredness of the individual and his conscience. Number two, the value of human community. Third, the greater power of truth, compassion, and love over hatred, enmity, and selfish self-interest. And fourth, the profound hope that good will finally prevail. It is goals and ideals, not mere creeds or catechisms or theologies, which will ultimately unite the spiritual heritages of our planetary past into a vibrant and vital religion of the future, which will affirm the universal sovereignty and the fatherhood of God and the universal interdependence and brotherhood of all humankind. Therefore, ours must be a global vision of spiritual truth. There was a farmer once being solicited for money, for medical aid, for people in foreign lands. But the farmer said, well, I don't believe in foreign outreach. He said, I want what I give to charity to benefit my neighbors. So the person who was raising the money said, but who are your neighbors? And the farmer replied, why, those around me. He said, you mean those people whose land joins onto your land? The farmer said, yes. The fundraiser said, well, how much land do you hold? The farmer said, about 500 acres. The fundraiser said, how far down into the earth do you think you own that property? The farmer said he'd never thought about it much before. He supposed he owned it about halfway down to the center of the earth. The fundraiser said, exactly. And what I want this money for is to reach those neighbors of yours whose land adjoins your property at the bottom. Humankind must begin to think globally. Transportation and communication alone have made this a necessity. Jesus of Nazareth's most famous story was the parable of the prodigal son about a lad who unthinkingly went out and wasted his inheritance in riotous living. But the story goes on to say that one day when he was very hungry, he came to himself and he arose and returned to the house of his father. Consider a parallel. Today we are confronted with what many historians diagnose as a global nutrition and energy crisis. The specters of famine and starvation are quite real in numerous parts of the world, and yet this is a time of rich possibilities as well. For if, as in Jesus' parable of the prodigal son, when the lad was, quote, very hungry, he decided to return to his father, then I would tell a parable of a prodigal planet of a world obsessed by the quest for material things, a world wasting its substance in frequently riotous living, and yet which, when it became very hungry, began to realize that materialism is a fickle philosophy, that there is enough on this earth to meet the needs of mankind, but there will never be enough on this earth to meet the greeds of mankind. And this prodigal planet, through the years of its evolution, thus began to turn to the father of all, and a great spiritual awakening began which swept the world from sea to sea. The hour of diminishing global resources in which we live is simultaneously an hour of tremendous spiritual possibilities for this prodigal planet Earth. And we are called to labor for a spiritual renaissance which one day will transform this world into the global village, the family of God, in truth it was created to be. But we must not become impatient in our expectations of a new age of truth on our planet. Back in Kansas, I heard the story about a little branch railroad years ago in the days of the steam locomotives, and it was rattling along across the pasture land of the blue stem flint hills of eastern Kansas when this train ground to a stop. One of the passengers impatiently asked the brakeman what was wrong, and he said, well, there's a herd of cows on the track. In about ten minutes, the train lurched forward again, jerked along convulsively for another mile or two, and then it came to a halt once more. Same passenger, this time utterly exasperated, yelled out to the brakeman, what is it this time? The brakeman said, we caught up with that herd of cows again. Spiritual evolution, too. Travails and lurches along at a sometimes rickety pace. Read planetary history for a while. But we must learn the dangers of the spiritual toxin impatience. We must be willing to work in long-term far-sightedness toward the goal which lies before us and labor in wisdom. Years ago, there was a man, an aged merchant. He had two sons, but the old man had decided to retire from his business. In order to determine which one of his sons should be left in charge of his properties, he made this test. To each son, he gave a dollar. 
And he said, buy with this dollar something which will fill this house. The eldest son hastened out, determined the cheapest thing he could buy for a dollar was some hay, which he spread all over the floors of the house. Even at that, there wasn't enough to cover it all. But the younger son, after deliberating on the challenge, went out and bought all of the cheapest candles he could find, took them home, lighted them, one in each room of the house, and the light which they gave filled the home. To you, said his father, I give over my business, for you have displayed wisdom. Without spiritual advancement, all of the rest of our material progress on this earth is virtually in vain. Without love for God and love for each other, our scientific and technological advancement is as a scattering of straw, for only the light of spiritual truth can ultimately illumine the world, as it can ultimately illumine every individual life. The kingdom of God is within you, a spark of spirit, an ember of eternity indwells the mortal mind. And only a global spiritual renaissance can bring true light to this spiritually twilight planet. May it begin with you in a living love for God and for others, with a conviction of personality survival, life after death, with a certainty that God has a plan and purpose for your life and spiritually can transform you so that you can begin to live as you were born and created to live as the son or daughter of God, you in truth and in fact really are. And then write to us, will you? We really want to hear from you at the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644. I've written Finding God, Getting to Know God, Growing Spiritually, Seven Principles of Prayer, Life After Death, any and all of this literature, yours free, without cost, charge, or obligation when you write to us. For those of you listening in other countries around the world over our international satellite and shortwave network, let me spell out mailing address, Box 3080, Oakhurst, O-A-K-H-U-R-S-T, California, C-A-L-I-F-O-R-N-I-A, 93644, USA. This is a non-sectarian, non-profit program proclaiming the dawning spiritual renaissance, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, the worldwide family of God. And so for now, this is Vern Benham Grimsley saying, May God's will be done by you. Good day.